our service this morning by observing the Lord's Supper. And before we do, we always stop and remember the significance of the bread and the cup. The bread is the broken body of our Lord Jesus, who is willing to be broken for our sin. And of course, the cup represents the blood that was shed that gives us the opportunity for salvation, to have our sins made clean, made white as snow. But on top of that, the Lord's Supper is also a time of reflection, because when you stop and think about it, Paul reminded us that as we receive the elements, we should do so in reflection on our own lives. And if there are things in our life that we know are not right with God, we should confess those things because the good news is what the Lord's Supper means is that our confession leads to forgiveness. Without the Lord's Supper, without what Christ did on the cross, our confession to the Lord would have no meaning. But because Jesus did what he has done for us, then as we receive these elements, let's do so in a heart of humi- with a heart of humility and with a mind of confession before the Lord as we are made clean every day by the blood that he has shed upon the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, as we enter into this time, we love you. We thank you, Father God, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Jesus, that you were born of a virgin, that you lived a perfect, sinless life, that you willingly went to the cross and shed your blood and had your body broken, that we might know life everlasting. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, today for your glorious resurrection and your ascension to heaven. And we know that one day you will come to judge the earth in righteousness. And we're thankful, Lord, that when you look upon us, it is not not our sin that will be seen, but the sacrifice that you have made. In Jesus' name, amen.
During dinner, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he shared it with his disciples. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you.
After dinner, Jesus took the cup, and he said to his disciples, Take and drink all of this, for this is my blood, which is shed for the redemption of many. Lord, once again, we come before you just to thank you for your love and your mercy extended to us through the cross. Thank you for giving us this wonderful opportunity, Lord, to be reminded of the sacrifice that you have made. May we carry it with us every day as we're reminded of your broken body and your shed blood, which has made eternity possible for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to somebody this morning. That's right. Make them feel welcome here at Brushy Creek. glad that each one of you are here with us worshiping the Lord this morning. This morning we have a special guest with us, um, Jay Hardwick. He is the Chief Strategist and Assistant Executive Director for the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And so, um, so honored to have him join us this morning. He's going to come and he is going to talk to us about some of the just the great things that God is doing in and around our state. And so would you welcome Jay uh, to the stage this morning. Thank you, Brushy Creek. It is a joy and an honor to be able to worship with you today and to be here and be a part of what God is doing here in this great church. You may not know this, you're one of about 2,000 South Carolina Baptist churches. And when you think about uh, 2,000 churches, you think about churches of all different sizes, you think of churches of all different kinds of worship styles, you think about churches that might be in more city-type locations and those that may be in the country. And uh, what God has given us as a state convention is a vision that we pray will bring together and align all 2,000 of those faith families. And that is a vision that every life would be saturated and transformed by the hope of the gospel beginning here in South Carolina. And here's why that vision is so important. Because right now, you may not know this, but there are about 3.6 million people that call South Carolina home that have no connection to a faith family whatsoever. Many of those folks, we can assume, do not have a relationship with Jesus as well. And not only that in South Carolina, but there are some 5 billion people in the world that still have little to no access to the gospel. And so what we want to be about as a, as a convention of churches, as a family of churches that you are a part of, is we want to be a part of a vision that says we want to make sure that every man, woman, and child in the state of South Carolina and every man, woman, and child, and every tribe, nation, and tongue in all the earth has the opportunity to see, hear, and respond to the gospel. To see that happen, what we do as a convention every week, every month, every year, is we want to come alongside churches just like Brushy Creek and simply ask the question, how can we help you and your church fulfill the Great Commission? How can we help you advance? How can we t help you take the next steps that maybe God is leading you to be a strong church with a vibrant Sunday morning worship experience, with a clear process to make and multiply disciples, led by a healthy leadership team that is ready to lead the church forward into the future? How can we help your church serve your community in fresh ways where you can be the hands and feet of Jesus to those that maybe are right here in your community but have needs and maybe would see the gospel as a means of then later hearing the gospel? How can we help you have a plan to share the gospel meaningfully with those that are close to you but far from God and see people changed by the gospel and see them baptized into the life of the local church? How can we help you send workers to the nations? How can we help you develop partnerships where you can train and send your people, your very own, to connect with people all over the world that maybe right now don't have a relationship with Jesus and maybe have never even heard the gospel? How can we help your church be a church planting church? Or maybe you partner with other churches to start new work in areas of our communities, areas of our state that need the gospel. We call that plan advance. Strong churches that are serving their communities, that are sharing hope, that are sending workers, and are working together to start new work. And our belief is that any church, any size, 
anywhere in the state of South Carolina can advance in fulfilling the Great Commission. And that's why churches like Brushy Creek are so important. And that's why what I want to say to you today is very simply this. Thank you. Thank you for being a church that is advancing in the Great Commission. And that's not something that you just decided to start doing this week. That's something you've been doing throughout the entirety of your history. You've been a church that's been engaged in missions around the world. You've been engaged in church planting here locally, across the country, and around the world. You've been active in mobilizing yourselves to share the gospel here throughout the Greenville community, especially as this community continues to grow so rapidly. And I want to say to you, thank you. Thank you for being a church that we can point to and we can point other churches to as an example of what it looks like to be a church that's advancing and fulfilling the Great Commission. And I also want to say this, thank you for your generosity. You have been a faithful, generous, giving church to the cooperative program. And don't just hear me say thank you, but I want you to hear thank you from the thousands of middle school and high school students that experienced the gospel last summer in our camps and will again this coming summer. I want you to hear thank you from the hundreds of college students that have come to faith in Jesus on our college campuses through our Baptist Collegiate Ministries and have been sent on mission around the country and around the world each summer. I want you to hear thank you from the dozens of pastors, maybe even hundreds of pastors, that have grown in their leadership and have been met at crisis points in their lives and ministry because of the faithful giving and support of churches like Brushy Creek. I want you to hear thank you from the dozens of church planters all over South Carolina right now who are, who are starting new work in areas where there is great need for the gospel. Your giving through the cooperative program is funding those efforts. So middle school and high school, high school students are coming to faith in Christ. College students are coming to faith in Christ and being sent on mission. Churches are being planted and missionaries are being sent. And it's because of the example of churches like yours and it's because of the generosity of churches like yours. So Brushy Creek, we pray for you. We thank God for you. We pray his richest blessings on you as you continue forward in advancing and fulfilling the Great Commission. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your continued generosity. It's my honor now to pray as we move into a time of giving as an act of worship to the Lord. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this great church. Thank you for their commitment to the Great Commission. And thank you for the ways that you have used this church throughout the years to be a bright light for the gospel in this community and around the world. And as Brushy Creek continues forward into the future, Lord, I pray your hand would be upon her. I pray that you would continue to lead her and strengthen her and use her as a a means of displaying the gospel to this community. That men, women, and children would come to faith in Christ because of the ongoing ministry of this great church. That that would happen not just here in Greenville County, but it would happen to the ends of the earth. I thank you for the generosity of this great church. Thank you for the generosity of the families that that are in this congregation today. And I pray that now as we give, that Lord, you would bless these gifts that are given. That you would use them, that you would multiply them. That they would be used to make your name great in all the earth. Beginning here in Greenville County and extending to the ends of the earth. So we give now. And we worship in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. I really appreciate Benji preaching last week. The only thing I regret is that I wasn't here to hear it. Um, I was looking forward to that, but I looked on the calendar and realized Denise and I were both off on Monday. And so we slipped off to the beach. Had a little uh, weekend down there, but uh, we missed you. I missed you. I missed being here last Sunday morning. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. We're going to look at verses 14 through 30. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to begin with verse 14. Let's stand together as we read God's word. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. 
The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave, for you were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered not, no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you. You can be seated. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about working while we're waiting. And I want to ask you a question, to, and I want you to think about this with me. Is there anything more frustrating than a missed opportunity? And we see that all the time. We've heard stories of walking away from people walking away from a project only to have the next person step up and see great fruit, and we realize that only if there had been just a little bit more perseverance, maybe a tad bit more patience, then the person who began the project would have seen the fruit and seen it to its fruition. We've all seen football games where a team is on the one-yard line about to score, and they fumble the ball away. And we think about that, and we see that as a missed opportunity. We see athletes who are incredibly gifted, amazing, with amazing talent. They have a bright future, but that future is cut short, maybe because of drug abuse or or because of criminal activity. We've all been in a position, or perhaps at one time or another, where we had a chance to buy a piece of land, and we waited, and we we thought, and we we decided, we just couldn't decide, and, and the land gets sold to somebody else, and five years later, it doubles in value. All these things are examples of missed opportunities. And the Bible is filled with passages of Scripture that urges us to be alert and to make the most of the opportunities that God gives us. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6, Solomon wrote these words, Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening because you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed or whether both of them will be good. Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5, He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. Isaiah, speaking about our desire for the presence of the Lord, said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Don't let the opportunity go by to have a heart, a passion for the Lord, to be close to him. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul put it this way, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is is the day of salvation. So the parable of the talents is really a parable about readiness that is demonstrated by persistence in serving. And I can say this, it is impossible to have a serving life without a saving faith. It's also impossible to possess a saving faith that doesn't reveal itself in a life that serves. And that serving life should be characterized by generosity. In other words, when we give, we give according to that which God has blessed us with. We give with a heart that is to please the Master. We give and we give of our talents. We give of the physical things that God has blessed us with. So many times when we focus on giving, we think about financial giving. And financial giving is important because without it, we can't function. We can't come together. We can't have ministries. The South Carolina Baptist Convention could not send people around the world or form partnerships without people faithfully giving what God has blessed them with financially. 
But that's only one aspect of being generous in our giving. Just as we see in the parable of the talents, God and, and gives us or pours into us ability that he expects us then to generously invest in the kingdom. And when we invest our gifts and abilities, then God gives us the increase. He brings the fruit. But he wants us to do so with a heart that is to serve him. Now the first thing we see is the responsibility that we do receive from the Lord because God gives us a responsibility. The talents show that each person is given according to the ability that God has given them. You know what's good news this morning? It's good news that God doesn't expect you to do more than God has gifted you with. God is the God of the perfect amount. He never puts burdens <clears throat> on us that we're unable to bear. He never allows us to be tempted above or beyond our ability to push back against that temptation. And so God is the God of the perfect amount. He gives us responsibility based on the ability because he is our master and he knows us. He knows our heart and he pours into us according to the ability that he knows he's blessed us with. And he doesn't ask us all to produce the same amount. I mean, I'm thankful that I don't have to produce the amount that someone else does who's gifted above my ability. God's not going to hold me responsible for something that I don't produce if he hasn't gifted me for that purpose. But God does expect me to wholeheartedly and with a generous spirit and with a giving heart pour out that which he has blessed me with. The owner in the parable, of course, is Jesus. And he's gone on a long journey. And we know that Jesus is on a long journey back to heaven. The servants that we see here are believers who are part of the visible church. You know, the 12, the, when you go back and look at the 12 disciples, they're a good example of what having different gifts and abilities are all about. You had the 12 disciples, but you had the inner circle. Peter, James, and John were obviously the inner circle around Jesus. Peter was the leader. God had gifted him for that purpose. John had a different gift set than Peter had. All of the disciples, after the resurrection, some played major leadership roles, some played support roles, because that's how God gifted them. That's what God called them to do. So giving and being generous in our giving first involves understanding how God has gifted us and then understanding how the gifts that God has given us fit into the kingdom as a whole you know if you're gifted to be a teacher teach and do it with your whole heart if you're gifted to be a servant serve step up when the call goes out for service for people to step up with their gifts and serve within the church if you've been gifted financially give because god doesn't bless us with material possessions so that we can use them for our own benefit alone Certainly God doesn't mind us using the financial benefits he's given us to take care of our basic needs and to take care of our families. But beyond that, God blesses us as believers with a heart that should say that we are generous in the way that we give. The standard, certainly the tithe is the standard that God has set. In fact, the tithe is holy. It's something that is set apart. God said, this is mine, and it's the first fruit the tithe, we begin with the tithe because first fruit doesn't always just mean what the first por portion that we earn. It has to do with setting aside first that which belongs to God. And then to be generous, we can give beyond. It, it, a, a generous heart is, some, is a heart that looks at what God, the standard God has set and even gives beyond that out of the blessing that he pours into our life. You know, we're blessed in that you saw a report this morning. You know, this has been a challenging year for the budget at Brushy Creek Baptist Church. But the good news is, during the month of December, so many people stepped up and gave out of a spirit of generosity that we ended up with over $150,000 surplus above the expenses that we had. Now, that's not money that we took in above the budget. 
but because of good stewardship you combine those things good stewardship with a generous spirit of giving and god pours out his blessing and he has done so for us we should be thankful we should praise his name we should give him the glory because it is out of a generous heart and out of the provision that he has given people in their lives that made it possible for there to be a surplus in 2019 after a difficult year for the church but you know what god takes all the things in our lives doesn't he he takes all the good stuff he takes all the challenges he takes the trials and if we respond to god in a way that honors him he pours all of that together mixes it up and it's for our good and his glory and it always turns out that way but we have to be sure that that's what we're doing we need to respond we respond with a heart that says generosity god has poured and continues to pour into our lives being ge a generous portion of his goodness you know i think about a river and if you ever stand on the bank of a river and look as the water moves swiftly it's carrying a lot of stuff it's carrying stuff that you can see and it's carrying stuff that you can't see as it begins to reach its final destination whether that be the ocean or a lake or wherever it is the water begins to slow down and as it does it deposits that which it's carrying a lot of times forming a delta maybe heading into as it pours into a lake you know as god has poured gifts into us and as god has poured his living water the moving water of the holy spirit working in and through us those gifts that he deposits we pour into each other and into the body and as we do that we're able to accomplish so much more than we can if we just simply hoard our gifts or refuse to pour them out just like these servants that are described in the parable of the talents now let's look at the reaction that we should have when god gifts us and gives us abilities in verse 16 through 18. the servant that was giving five talents was excited about his opportunity to serve the master he went and traded he retraded as long as his master was away notice he didn't just invest one time he invested and invested and invested he continued to be generous with his talent and ability until the master came back you know sometimes we reach a place in life and we think you know it's time for me just to slow down it's time for me to just find a place and kind of a little corner of life and just kind of let life go by until I go to be with the master there's nothing in this parable that speaks of that the Bible calls us as long as we have strength as long as we have ability to pour it out generously for the Lord for his glory and for each other and for the benefit of the body and God will strengthen us for that task you may say well preacher I can't get around quite as well as I used to <laughs> I know what you mean these old knees of mine that I thought would never leave me you know I'm, I'm, I'm gonna find out when I get to heaven I'm gonna ask the Lord I'm gonna say why did my knees not last as long as the rest of me you know and, there, and I'm sure there's a reason could have something to do with spending more on tennis rackets than I did on tennis shoes when I was playing tennis but here's the thing whatever we have to face physically whatever we face as we grow older God knows about those things he knows about our limitations remember he's the one that pours the gifts and abilities into us and he loves us and he knows us and he knows how we can serve and he gives us those opportunities to continue to serve generously throughout our life so the reaction we should have well it should be like the first servant or the second servant because the second servant was not jealous that he didn't get five talents he just went out and doubled what he was given when he was given two we should take what we have and use it the servant that received two wasn't complaining and the servant who received five didn't say to the lord why have you given me so much responsibility you know sometimes having talent and gift and responsibility is can be a burden to us if we don't use it in the way that god intends in other words we might say sometimes why in the world am i having to bear all of these responsibilities the answer is simple because god has gifted you with the ability and knows what you can do and so that but but the one who had five talents 
he wasn't discouraged because he had more responsibility. The one who had two talents was not discouraged because he didn't have five talents. So many times, sometimes, I should say, not necessarily so many, but we can become envious of what others have and we spend our time coveting and complaining instead of serving and sowing what God has given us. We should never look at another person and say, I wish I had what they have. That's coveting. We should never look at another person and say, well, I can't do much because they can do so much. What can I do compared to them? I'll tell you what you can do. You can do exactly what God has gifted you to do. Just find the generous spirit that you have and pour it out into what God has called you to do. We give generously. You know, nowhere in the Word of God do we find a command to store up treasures on earth. What we're given, we use. If you look at Luke 12, we have the story of the wealthy farmer, a man who had so much that he said to himself, you know what, I'm going to build more barns. I don't have enough places to put my stuff. So I'm going to get some more stuff places, and I'm going to stuff those places with all my possessions. And the Lord spoke to him that night and said, you're foolish. For tonight, your life is required of you. Who's going to get your stuff now? You know, probably like you, we've, we've got a building at, in, at, at our house that we call the shop, but it's actually just a glorified storage building. I mean, it's down behind the house, and if, when you open the door, you don't open the door without full pads and a football helmet <laughs> because there's no telling what's going to come bouncing out of there. I mean, we just recently had to go down there because we had to get the Christmas decorations. And I mean, in my house, I can hear the music go, da-da-da, when Denise says, would you go down and get the Christmas decorations? I'm like, no, no, I have to go and open the door because there's so much stuff in there. I mean, I can't believe it. And do you, do you know that the only time we go down there is to get the Christmas decorations? You know what that makes me wonder? How much of that stuff did we need when we got it since it's down there and I just have to move it out of the way to get the Christmas decorations once a year? And then we have a yard sale. It always fascinates me. I love yard sales because people take the stuff that you've got that you don't want and they think it's great. And they pay you for it. What? We, we need to do that. We really do. We need to understand that when God blesses, he blesses us to be a river, not a reservoir. Let's be people who give generously and allow what God gives us to flow through us into the body. Third thing, the reckoning that we face is in verse 19 through 27. The master was gone for a long time. Maybe the servants thought he wasn't coming back, but he did come back. And when he did, the first order of business was to settle his accounts. And those who were faithful received three things. They, they received praise, they received possessions, but you know what they got more than anything else? The presence of the master. See, that's, that's the beautiful thing about this story. The servant not only entered into or received the, the benefit of what he had invested, but he entered into the presence of the master, the joy of being with the master. One day when this life is over, we will enter into the joy of being with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you know what? Heaven's not going to be a boring place. I don't know how many of it. First of all, we're not going to be angels. Can, can I straighten that out? I, I, I probably don't have to here because I'm sure. But when people say, well, I, I'm, I'm going to get my wings. No, you're not. Angels are angels and people are people. And we, in fact, the Bible talks about the fact that we will actually have positions maybe of responsibility over the angels because of we were created in the image of God. But here's the good news. Heaven's not going to be about sitting around on a cloud with a stringed instrument singing to each other every day. Boy, aren't you glad. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm glad I don't have to hear you sing for eternity. No, <laughs> d- never mind. But, but what, what I'm talking about is that heaven is not going to be a boring place. Heaven is a place where God is preparing us right now for what we're going to do for eternity. And I don't know what it's going to be, but it will be exactly what matches who God has made us to be. And it will be a, a glorious thing, a glorious opportunity. 
That is the reckoning. You know, the servant that had five talent, the servant that had two, that gained so much more, they were humble about what they had gained. You know what I love to see when I watch a football game or any other athletic contest? When an athlete does good, it really just, it hurts me when they thump their chest, do some kind of ridiculous dance. You know, we look at that and I think, I'm thinking to myself, you're an adult. Do you know how foolish that looks? And I know I'm an old guy, I get it. But I just, you know, I'd rather not see, because so many of them, instead of doing this, Maybe they'll drop to one knee, or maybe they just stop and look up to heaven. You know why that's important? Because they understand that the giftedness that gave them the ability to be successful was not produced by them. It was given by God. And then they developed it as good stewards. And they gave back with a heart of generosity. They recognized their gifts, and they used them. And so the reckoning we face, it's a reckoning because God will hold us accountable to whether we use the gifts and ability that he's given us for his glory. And notice it isn't something extra when we simply serve the Lord out of obedience. That's not doing something extra. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In other words, it's not something extra. It's what God has called us to do and be. The master gave high praise. He gave great reward to his faithful servants. And finally, the faithful servant, as we said, got the ultimate reward of the presence of the master. The third servant had nothing but a bad attitude to present to his master. Do you like being around people that have a bad attitude? Nobody does. I mean, we, even as we come together on Sunday morning, we are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. We're celebrating the resurrection. Why are we here on Sunday? You know, when I was in Southeast Asia, their day of worship is Friday, which is, I mean, that's fine. That's their tradition. That's when the churches come out. That's essentially when most people come to worship. But I got to tell you, I like coming to church on the day that the Lord rose from the grave. Because it reminds me, and nothing wrong, listen, nothing wrong, there are churches that have Saturday services and they add services. I'm, I'm not into all of the technical stuff that sometimes we get into arguments over. But there is some, there's something special about coming and worshiping on the day that the Lord rose from the grave because we celebrate that resurrection. We celebrate that power that then is poured into us. And we should have a great attitude when we come to church. But sometimes we get around, you've been around people at work that they just want to complain all the time. They just, there's just nothing good in the world going on. Or sometimes we get wrapped up in the politics of the day. And listen, <laughs> you know me, I've been calling everybody to call your senator and let's get behind the heartbeat bill. There are things that we need to do to participate in the, the, the democratic republic, the constitutional republic that we've been given, there are things that we need to do. We have a responsibility there. But we shouldn't get so wrapped up in it that it causes us to hate our brothers and sisters who disagree. Folks, not everybody thinks that's true, but I'm telling you, God has not called us to judge other people based on our differences. God has called us to love one another and to pour out ourselves generously. And that, that doesn't mean that we stand back from the things that we believe. No, we stand forth. We defend those things with zeal, but not to the point that it causes us to come bit, become bitter and angry and wrapped up in it all the time. The third servant blamed his master. Can you believe that? I mean, he's lazy. He puts the money in the ground. He doesn't do anything with it. And then he looks at the matter. Well, it's your fault because you're a hard man. And, and I know that, man, you'd have been after me if I didn't produce something. I was afraid I might lose it, so I hid it in the ground. Do you, you know where I hear an echo? It echoes all the way back to Genesis. It sounds a little bit like Adam, doesn't it? Well, Lord, that woman that you gave me, you know, Lord, I, I just can't imagine saying that, saying that to God with a straight face. You remember when God gave Adam Eve, he was excited. In fact, 
the Hebrew, if you want a direct translation, first time he saw Eve, it's like when he was naming the animals, he would say, no, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. Eve steps up, he goes, wow, this is it. That's what it says in Hebrew. Check it out. And yet, then, just a short time later, he's going, yeah, that woman, yeah, she might be it, but you gave her to me. That's on you. Here's the servant with the same attitude, and it's a terrible attitude. Think about the story of the prodigal son for just a minute. You know, at first reading, it looks like you had a bad son who went away and a good son who stayed faithful to his father. But you know what's true? What we find out in the end is that the son who kept his feet under his father's table was just as far away from his father's heart as the one who was in the pigsty because he wouldn't rejoice when his brother came home. And the reason, listen to what the Bible says about when Jesus told that parable. He was angry, talking about the, the brother. He refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he said to his father, look, these many years I've served you and I've never disobeyed your command, but you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. In other words, Dad, I did all this serving for what's in it for me, not because I was thinking about how much I love you. What caused that servant, what caused that servant son to come to himself in the pigsty it was his father's house the desire he had for his father and to go back home and that's the desire that we should have because that's the desire that leads to a generous heart a heart that gives whatever god has given us the brother served grudgingly not generously he served out of a heart of obligation if we're going to be generous and the way that we give, and we're talking about giving 1% more in 2020. Now, that could be 1% more financially, certainly. We hope that God will move and, and that you'll give financially to Brushy Creek because we believe that the ministries here are solid and that the leadership is leading the church in the right direction. But I would challenge you and ask you to do this. Don't stop at your pocketbook. Give 1% more of the gifts that God has poured into you. Be generous with the talent, with the ability that God has poured into you, regardless of what it is. Because we see finally the reward we gain. For everyone who has, more will be given and they will have an abundance. God blesses us with these abilities and he calls us to serve in what he has provided and then he rewards faithful service. You know, there was a movie that was out a few years ago called The Monuments Men. Now, a lot of people didn't see this movie. It was kind of an all-star cast, but it was about sort of an obscure thing that happened during World War II, but it was very important. And it was the story about a woman in Paris. Her name was Claire Simone. She was played by Kate Blanchett. And she was waiting. She didn't know this, but she was waiting for somebody named James Granger, played by Matt Damon, who would show up at the right moment. But she had no idea to know whether anybody would show up to help her or not. What was she doing? Well, she was, categori she was categorizing and sealing with a marker the art that the Nazis were taking away. All of this art. And she just, she just remained faithful. She worked and sustained her work without any hope of knowing that anybody would ever show up to help her or to cause her work to come to fruition. And yet she worked faithfully. And one day, James Granger showed up, and the Monuments Men went and recovered a lot of the art that was whisked away by the Nazis. Here's the point of the story, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we work in the same way. We pour out our gifts and abilities. We don't know the day that the reward will come. We don't know the end result of what will happen with what we pour out into other people's lives. You know, one of the most gratifying things that happens to me at North Greenville University, I'll, every now and then I'll have a student that comes back by and they stop in the office and they say, Dr. Beam, you said such and such one day in class. And it touched me to the point that it caused me to change the direction of my life. And now I'm doing this for God's glory because you were faithful. God used your faithfulness in my life. <sighs> See, that's what, that's what we want as believers. 
that we're so generous in our giving that God takes it and multiplies it in the lives of the people that we pour into. And the good news is, yeah, Miss Simone, Claire Simone in Paris, had no guarantee that her work was going to bear fruit. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a hope, a blessed hope, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We know he's coming again. And we know one day that if we go to be with him before he comes back, we'll stand before him and we'll be able to know that our work was never in vain. That when we gave generously and obediently, there will be a reward. And the ultimate reward in that day is the presence and the praise of the master. And then you know what we'll do? We'll turn around and put that right back at his feet. Because we'll know that only through his power did we accomplish any of it. Let's stand together for our prayer. God, I pray in these moments, as we come to a time of decision, I ask you, Lord, to touch hearts and to speak to people about what they can give, about how, Lord, you've talented and gifted each one. Understand what it, understanding, Lord, what it means to be generous begins with us understanding how you've gifted us so that we know how to give back. Help us to know this, Lord, and then to give with a heart that praises you, not out of resentfulness or obligation, but because we love you and we know you've called us to this task. In Jesus' name.